This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Rabbi David Saperstein is the director of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism in Washington, D.C., where he represents the National Reform Jewish Movement to Congress and the administration. The center not only advocates on a broad range of social, issues, social justice issues, but provides extensive legislative and programmatic materials used by synagogues, federations, and Jewish community relations councils nationwide. During his 30-year tenure, he has headed several national religious coalitions. He currently co-chairs the Coalition to Preserve Religious Liberty and serves on the boards of numerous national organizations, including the NAACP and People for the American Way. Also as an attorney, Rabbi Saperstein teaches seminars in both First Amendment church-state law and in Jewish law at Georgetown University Law School. His publications include Jewish Dimensions of Social Justice, Tough Moral Choices of Our Time, and his forthcoming book, Racing with God, The Use and Abuse of Religion in American Elections. Rabbi Saperstein is part of a large rabbinic family Great uncles on both sides of his family were reform rabbis. Two great grandfathers were orthodox rabbis. His father and uncle were well-known reform rabbis. And he has a brother who, who is one of our leading Jewish scholars. Thank you so much and please welcome Rabbi Saperstein. When we gather for this conversation about uh, progressive religious values, I want to talk today about what links us together with other religious traditions um, and some of the distinctive Jewish approaches uh, to this uh, question. But we come today, and you couldn't have picked a more timely moment in history to have this conversation because we're at a crossroads. We're at a crossroads in America on an array of economic justice and civil rights issues, on efforts to find an ex expeditious way to begin withdrawal from Iraq in a manner that has the best chance to stabilize the weak uh, political structures there, in terms of the balance between civil liberties and national security, in terms of trying to stop a nuclear proliferation, efforts to reverse the impact of ultra-conservative judges to our federal bench in the Supreme Court who would undo the Warren and Burger Court's expansion of civil rights and civil liberties and a, a strong wall separating church and state. Um, our nation is making the most fundamental decisions about the role of government in securing the economic and social well-being of its people in rebuffing those forces that threaten our religious tolerance and liberty and in reshaping our role in an increasingly complex world. And indeed, the world is at a crossroads in deciding how to navigate the clash of civilizations in confronting the growingly pervasive threat of terrorism in resolving in the face of global climate change and global poverty whether we are really truly committed to making reasonable sacrifices now to ensure that our children and children's children, indeed all God's children, will enjoy the fruits of God's creation and wealth as surely as do we. And for those of us as American Jews who have Israel as one of the centers of our love and concern, Israel is at a crossroads in finding a way to resolve its differences with the surrounding nations in a manner that allows for Palestinians and others to fulfill their political aspirations even while every day it must act, day in and day out, to secure militarily and diplomatically the safety of its citizens in a world in which messages of anti-Semitism and hatred of Israel are sounded with a frequency and intensity not heard in so many decades. 
in terms of the Jewish perspective on Israel, it bears a moment just to say the obvious, that whatever one thinks of Israeli policy, whether one is a critic of Israeli policy or a supporter of Israeli policy, that all those in the pro-Israel community overwhelmingly start with an axiom and a postulate that if it is not understood, will make the Jewish, or it's true of non-Jewish supporters of Israel, but certainly the Jewish passions about Israel, otherwise not understandable. And that axiom and postulate is the following. If the Arab countries believed that they could militarily destroy Israel today, they would not hesitate to do so. And only Israel's strength, enhanced by American support, stands in the way of that happening. That is a filter through which most Jews see what is at stake in the struggle for Israel's survival and well-being. And that is true of people like me who are strong critics of Israeli policy very often and believe that Israel's survival is equally tied up with the ability of the Palestinian people to determine their own political destiny and to have a viable state of their own. But in the end, if you don't understand that beginning axiom, you cannot understand what drives so much of the Jewish passion about Israel's security. But Israel is at a crossroads as well in terms of a variety of domestic challenges, a mounting environmental and water crisis endangering the stability of Israel and the region. A number of experts, strategic experts, argue that the next war in the Middle East will be over shrinking environmental resources, particularly water. It's growing gap between the rich and the poor, now second only to the United States in the developed world. 1959, it was second only to Sweden in terms of the smallest gap between the rich and the poor. Today, it's second only to the United States in terms of the largest gap. It's vaunted educational health systems under enormous strains. Bedouins and Israeli Arabs generally so thwarted in achieving equal rights and opportunities. The growing divide between the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, and the rest of Israel exacerbated by the persistent refusal of the government of Israel to fully recognize the non-Orthodox streams, both in violation of its own values enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and of its abiding interest as a Jewish state for all. And it is at a crossroads in deciding whether it will finally allow a tapestry of authentic Jewish responses capable of meeting the diverse needs of its citizenry to flourish. Indeed, the recent flexing of the muscles of the ultra-Orthodox courts in rejecting retroactively years of conversion supervised by the head of the conversion process that was recognized by the Orthodox chief rabbinate of Israel has sent shockwaves and seismic rifts through the Jewish world. Never before in Jewish history has this happened. So the United States, the world, Israel, all seem to be at a crossroads. And I would argue that the voice of the progressive religious community is needed now more than ever. So yes, progressive religion is also at a crossroads. For the past 40 years, the mainline Protestant communities in America have been shrinking. They've been shrinking in numbers. Their budgets have been shrinking. And while social justice remains a centerpiece of their vision religiously of the world, the cons politically conservative wings within those denominations have flexed their muscles in a way that has somewhat constrained their expression of their social justice passions. And the DC offices that had so robustly been at the core of a coalition of decency that achieved so much in the 1950s, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, all now have shrunk to a small fraction of the size to what they were when I first came to Washington in 1974. Take 
the Reform Jewish movement. We've been an exception to that over the last 40 years. For the last 40 years in the United States, the Reform Jewish movement has been the fastest growing theologically liberal denomination in the United States. Well, actually, we've been the only growing theologically liberal denomination in the United States. And in the US, on the one hand, we increasingly dominate in numbers, creativity, and programs the landscape of Jewish life in local communities across the nation. But at the same time, we have to recognize that something has changed in the culture of America, in the manner in which the media, the movies, and television, the cultural images we have, political discourse in America, has somehow shifted in a very demonstrable way in the last 60 years. There is today in America an equation between fundamentalism and authenticity, religious authenticity. When the media, political media talks about the religious vote, they're not talking about us. They're talking about the far right Protestant vote in the United States. When the world media talks about religious terrorists, it's talking about, in that term religion, fundamentalist elements of the Hindu community, the Muslim community, some of the extreme Jewish forces on the West Bank in Israel. Religion, an authentic expression of religion, has been bound up with this. When you see images of someone who is obviously Jewish in the movies, they're often a chassid, despite the fact that the Hasidic Jewish community makes up only a very small fraction of the American Jewish community. It didn't used to be this way. By the way, I think some of this is infiltrated the psyche of the mainline denominations and the liberal Jewish communities as well. I suspect, I've never seen anyone do a test for it, but if you ask the average fifth grade kid in a reform or conservative Jewish classroom to draw a picture, just say, draw a picture of a Jew, I'm willing to bet about a quarter to a third of them will draw a picture of a chassid. Even though nobody in their Jewish life is represented by that image of their immediate Jewish life, is represented by that image. And it didn't used to be that way. If you think about who were the images of authentic religion in America? For much of the period from the late 1800s into the 1960s, we were talking about John Courtney Murray and Reinhold Niebuhr and John Haynes Holmes and Stephen S. Wise and Abraham Joshua Heschel and Martin Luther King. As distortive as it was, fundamentalist Protestants were the Elma Gantries. It itself, an image that had problems at that time. But it was mainline religious voices in the main progressive religious voices who regarded as a manifestation of authentic religion in American life. What happened? What happened? How did we lose that? The answer to that is another talk. I put it on the table, though, as something progressive religious communities that you will hear in this lecture series all share in common. The question of how to retake the ground of the image of what constitutes authentic religious expression to include the mainline progressive religious communities of America as a central challenge that we face together. Indeed, I would argue, this is true on the world scene itself. If, for example, fundamentalist Hinduism, which has led to the use of force by Hindu forces in India, is going to be contained, it will not happen because of what the Protestant community does. 
And it will not happen because of what the Catholic community does or the Jewish community does. It will happen when we're able to work to strengthen moderate Hindu forces to contain those influences and expressions of their religion. The same is true with fundamentalist Islam. It will not be, uh, it will not be Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist forces that win the battle for the hearts and minds of the Muslim world between the majority of moderate Muslim thinkers and leaders and people against the minority, but the outspoken minority who dominate the entire culture and airwaves of much of Muslim life today, who represent a more extreme interpretation of Islam. It will not be non-Muslims who win that battle. It will be Muslims. And the question facing the religious world and the democratic political world is how do they assist helping moderate Muslims in that battle without delegitimizing them in the very act of embracing them? When America embraces moderate Muslims in Pakistan, it gives ammunition to fundamentalist critics of those moderate Muslims that they are the agents of Western cultural imperialism, religious imperialism, and they use it to discredit them amongst the very people we would hope that they would uh, influence. And the same was true when Christian and Jewish leaders speak out, praising people, endorsing them, helping to send resources to them, it can often have the impact of undermining them. I see this as one of the central challenges that American foreign policy faces. Again, a discussion for another time more fully, but one that I put on the table as being central to helping to strengthen the role of moderate progressive religion on the global scene. Spiritually, we know the power that liberal religion has in meeting the needs of 21st century people who in the main by numbers alone reject both the strictures of fundamentalist religion and the emptiness of secularism and crave avenues to find spiritual fulfillment in a modern, rational, existentially fulfilling way. And it is time that we cease the defensiveness we too often feel against fundamentalist assertiveness. We must have confidence that flows from the bedrock belief that our vision of religion is right. For Jews, that means that the encounter with the divine at Sinai and elsewhere, that from that encounter, men and women have used their God-given wisdom, vision, and creativity to shape our sacred texts, and that that process has continued through the ages until today. By the way, I would say parenthetically, it has long fascinated me that while all the stories and legends and historic, many of the historical accounts uh, depicted in the Bible have close parallels in other religious, cultural, and historic traditions, only Sinai remains unique. I know of no other religion, culture, civilization that believe that at one moment an entire people had encountered the divine and were transformed by that encounter. And from that encounter flowed a revolutionary vision of ethical monotheism, of a God that has called humanity to righteousness and justice and called the Jewish people to be a holy people, charged with a prophetic mission to be alike to and of the nations, a vision that changed the history of all human kind. And no stream of Judaism today more inspiringly embodies that ancient badge of honor, I would argue, than does the liberal Jewish movement today. And no stream of Judaism understands more clearly the bottom line that I think affects every one of our religious traditions represented here today. That if the religion we offer our young does not speak to the great moral issues of their lives or the great moral issues of their world, if it focuses only on education or spirituality, it will fail to inspire their spirits or win their loyalty. 
Now, why is it that social justice has been, for the last century and a half, so central to our common endeavors? First and foremost, because God says so. Is it not self-evident that we cannot fulfill our destiny, however we understand it, to be a prophetic voice to the world about us, to be a light to the nations, to respond to God's call, to be a holy people, if we retreat from struggles for justice, peace, and equality in our nation and in our world. For Jews, we believe that we are called for a holy purpose and a holy mission, to be God's partners in shaping a better and more hopeful world. You shall be holy, for the eternal your God is holy, God commands in Leviticus. And how does God tell us? Can we strive to be like God? Can we manifest that holiness? The answer is clear, and it's one we share in all of our religious traditions, by feeding the hungry, and removing the stumbling block before the blind, by speaking out against injustice, and paying the labor a fair and timely wage, by creating courts of justice in a marketplace that is fair and honest. We cannot respond to this call without speaking truth to power. If Abraham, history's first known lobbyist, were willing to bargain, cajole, and advocate with God on behalf of the innocence of Sodom, can we do less with human rulers where we see injustice flourish and suffering multiply? Or as the American prophet Frederick Douglass observed, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did. It never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have found the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed on them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. This revision resonates through the entirety of the prophetic tradition. For Jews, it resonates through the Talmudic creation of the world's first social welfare system. It resonates through 1,200 years of extraordinary, the extraordinary charitable structures of the self-governing Jewish communities. And it resonates with religion's magnificent contribution to the evolution and values of contemporary democracy. Or to paraphrase the great Orthodox Jewish scholar Isidore Tversky, one cannot claim to be a God-intoxicated Jew without having an unquenchable thirst for social justice. Now just to say the obvious, in any of our traditions, this does not mean that social justice can or must or should replace religious study and religious worship or spirituality as the goals of building a religion for the 21st century. A genuine religious response must embody all for three. If not, and again here I speak in a Jewish voice, we would have to answer unanswerable Jewish questions. Which is more Jewish, wearing a kippah or clothing the naked? Which is more urgent, feeding our children matzah in a few weeks for Pesach or feeding the starving children of Darfur? Which is more important, to welcome as we do every Sabbath the Sabbath bride or to welcome the refugee fleeing persecution? Praying with kavanah, with intent and spirit or speaking out passionately against injustice? The heart of an authentic Jewish understanding is that we do not make such choices. That Jewish study inevitably leads to the soup kitchen. That Jewish prayer, amongst many valuable things, prepares us to do battle with injustice. And that Jewish social justice, without being rooted in Jewish study and ritual, is ephemeral and unsustainable. Social justice is so integrally woven into the tapestry we call Judaism that to pull that thread out distorts and neuters our Judaism. Our job is to weave together in the words of the Talmud, Torah, Vada, Gemila, Chasadim, Torah, worship, acts of loving kindness, study, worship, acts of loving kindness into a stronger tapestry of Jewish life. If that is the why of a progressive religious voice 
facing the 21st century. How about the what? Let me address some of the issues in Jewish perspectives and religious perspectives on those issues and apply some of these values to them. And then let me do so in stark Jewish terms here. The great debate that goes on in the Jewish community is what should we be more concerned about? Our particular Jewish issues, Israel's survival and security, the fight against anti-Semitism, religious freedom, issues that disproportionately and primarily affect the Jewish community, or issues of universal concern. I submit to you that on a very real political level, not always, but in the main, when you stop and think about it more deeply, they turn out to be one and the same. The great Talmudic Rabbi Hillel saw that in one of the most famous dictum of Jewish history, if I am not for myself, who should be for me? If I don't stand up for Israel, if I don't speak out and act against anti-Semitism, if I don't take care of uh, those in our community who are in need, if we don't ensure our kids are educated, who should we expect to do it for us? But if I am for myself alone, what am I? Not even who am I, but what am I? For to be a human being means to be for more than someone else. And of course, everyone agrees with, if not now, when? From, to be for ourselves and to be for others, Hillel teaches in his formulation, are integrally connected. So let me think through with you some of the particular Jewish concerns we have. And whether Jewish or non-Jewish in this room, you'll see how they connect with universal concerns. Take Israel. You can't worry about Israel without worrying about American foreign policy and military policy in general. And the universal in the particular are intertwined. Can't worry about Israel without worrying about the proliferation of nuclear and chemical and biological weapons. I'm proud of the fact that at the Religious Action Center that I run for the Reform Jewish Movement, we wrote the nation's first tough chemical and biological weapons anti-proliferation or helped write that legislation with tough sanctions behind it and led the way in shepherding it through Congress getting it passed unanimously even after the first President Bush vetoed it. That Israel was made a bit safer was, of course, a key concern. But so was our concern for our troops who were in that year were on the ground in the Persian Gulf War, we believe, facing chemical and biological weapons. And for 40 years, reversing the nuclear arms race has been a priority issue for my community. For as human beings, all of us are gravely in danger by a failure to halt nuclear proliferation. And the religious community has something vital to say on something that threatens all of God's creation. And the universal in a particular are one and the same. Samuel Pizar, the eloquent Holocaust survivor, said in his extraordinary speech before the Israeli Knesset at the second gathering of Holocaust survivors, the following words. To us, the Holocaust is not only an indelible memory of horror, it is a permanent warning. For we have seen the end of creation. In the shadow of permanently flaming gas chambers where Eichmann's reality eclipsed Dante's vision of hell, we have witnessed a pilot project for the destruction of humanity, the death rattle of the entire species on the eve of the atomic age, of thermonuclear proliferation, the final solution. Here with the authority of the numbers engraved on our arms, we cry out the commandments of six million innocent souls, children of whom I used to be one never again. From where, if not from us, will come the warning that a new combination of technology and brutality can transform the entire planet into a crematorium? From where, if not from the bloodiest killing ground of all time, will come the hope that coexistence between so-called hereditary enemies is possible, between Germans and Frenchmen, Chinese, Japanese, Americans and Russians, above all coexistence between Arabs and Jews. And the universal in the particular are inexorably bound up with each other. And you can't worry about Israel without worrying about energy policy. 
for reliance on Middle East oil has given the Arab nations a lever with which they have manipulated the foreign policies of many countries across the globe. And you can't worry about energy policy without worrying about environmental policy. And 50 years down the world road, when the world community has freed itself of oil-dependent technologies, Jewish environmentalists will be remembered for their enormous contribution, not only to Jewish values, to the state of the earth, to the interests of our respective of countries across the globe, but for Israel's security and well-being as well. And the universal and the particular turn out to be the one and the same. Or take the uh, domestic issue. You cannot worry about the growing needs of the elderly in our communities without addressing general policies like Medicare, prescription drug coverage, pension reform, nursing home reform that so broadly affect the elderly in our country. Now, why is this a particular concern? You may not know this, but the Jewish community is the oldest community in America. Median age of the Jewish community is about four years higher than the national average, higher than any other identifiable ethnic, racial, or religious community in America. And we're practicing, in part, that's not surprising. We fit the demographic profile of those who live longer. Jews tend to be educated, know how to take care of themselves, if we're ill, we likely have a doctor in the family to call. And outside the Orthodox world, we are the only community in America that's been practicing zero population growth for three generations. And all of these factors have created an inverted pyramid of an ever-growing number of younger Jews supporting through our Federation charitable systems in ever larger, ever older elderly population. And the two are willing to stand together with that great coalition of decency that transformed America for the better, represented by the people in this room, and insist that as a matter of national policy, those people who built this nation, fought its wars, paid its taxes, have the inalienable right to live out their lives with dignity and opportunity, then and only then will we be able to take care of our own, and indeed the universal in particular, turn out to be one and the same. Or take the issue of the struggle for our fundamental religious freedom and civil liberties and civil rights in America in particular in combating the threat of the religious right. The religious communities represented in this room have, in the main, been at the center of the efforts to contain the religious right's influence, at least politically, in America. It has been a difficult fight over the last 30 years, but so much depends upon it. Right now, the Warren and Burger Court's robust interpretation that asserted the rights of women and the rights of minorities, blacks, Latinos, Jews, Catholics, dissenters, agnostics, atheists, the disabled, against the whim of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males, much of those achievements hang by a thread at the Supreme Court level. For the last 15 years, cases that represented the embodiment of the Warren and Burger Court era decisions have come up to the court and been resolved by a 5-4 margin. Some have been victories for those who want a robust expansion uh, interpretation of our fundamental rights. Some have been defeats. But the ones that remain now hang by one vote. And in many of those votes, where it was 5 4 for the more robust interpretation, it was Sandra Day O'Connor who often agreed with the liberal four on the concept of a right, even though she would often turn around and then vote in the same case with the conservative four as to the application of those rights, often writing individual concurring decisions that controlled the decision and limited the application of the fundamental right she was defending. But with Justice Alito on the bench, we have no idea what the future will be. Now for Jews, this is of extraordinary importance. I suspect for those who are not Jewish in the room, these are views generally shared. But again, you have to understand the axiom in postulate. We Jews have won more rights, more freedoms, more opportunities in America than anywhere else in our history. And it is precisely because of the revolutionary founding concept of our Constitution. The combination of the three clauses 
in the Constitution dealing with religion. They were, of course, no religious test for office, free exercise of religion, and no law even respecting, touching on, an establishment of religion. And taken together, these three ideas created for the first time in human history a nation that asserted that your rights and opportunities as a citizen would no longer depend upon your religious identity, your religious practices, your religious beliefs. Like so many of the promises of the founding era, we didn't get there overnight. Religious establishments stayed in many states as late as into the 1830s in the United States. It really took to the Warren and Burger Court era, or at least beginning in 1947, that that founding vision was really embodied by the court's robust interpretation of these clauses. But when it did, what a difference it meant for religious minorities, and particularly for the Jews. It was exactly the period of Warren and Burger Court era that saw Jews move from the peripheries of American society. Many of our parents were old enough, and maybe some in this room, to remember when there were quotas keeping Jews out of major universities in America. Jews were kept out of many country clubs in America. Jews were kept out of many corporate boardrooms of America. It was precisely the cultural change embodied by the courts, the Warren and Burger courts, that allowed Jews the opportunities to move from the peripheries of American society to the very center of American political, professional, academic, economic life, and held open the promise for so many other groups that this too might be possible. And much of that hangs by a thread. We see this in the battle over school prayer that is renewing itself. We see it in the battle over scientific creationism, now in the guise of of intelligent design that's taking place in school, state school boards across the country. We see it in the battle over the posting of the Ten Commandments. I was, before he passed away, was debating uh, Reverend Falwell um, uh, once, and we were debating over whose Ten Commandments would be posted. Would it be the Catholic Douay version? Would it be the, um, uh, the uh, uh, revised standard uh, version of the Protestant uh, thing? Would it be what I think Reverend Fowell thought the original was, the King James um, uh, version? Um, would it be the Jewish version? And what did it mean to a kid if they could told the Ten Commandments, if they saw something different on the wall? What did it say to them about the government choosing somebody else's version of a religious message? I love the fact, by the way, it was the religious right groups when these cases went up to the Supreme Court even a couple of years ago, and the two decisions in the same term uh, came down that the religious right was arguing the Ten Commandments, it isn't really a religious message, it's a secular message about the history of America. As though somehow the notion, I am the eternal your God, thou shalt have no other gods before me, you shall not take the name of the eternal your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy are not deep and profound religious messages. And to make the argument in the court on what they had to know just wasn't true remains a, uh, a deeply disappointing compromise of fundamental values. I, I was struck, by the way, when there was a debate between... Um, uh, uh, between uh, Jay Sekulow, uh, Pat Robertson's uh, head legal uh, figure, and uh, Doug Laycock, I think the best church state lawyer in America, uh, that was on C-SPAN uh, a couple of days before the cases were heard at the Supreme Court, arguing over what, how these cases would go and what the outcome um, should be. And Sekulow's argument was, look at all the postings of the Ten Commandments that are etched into buildings or woven into a wall, to a wall the floor to ceiling. Tapering, what are we going to do? Rip them all out? It's a good question, by the way. Um, you're going to rip them all out, and once you let them stay somewhere, how do you draw the line um, uh, there? And he, he gave, he, he showed their brief. There are 40 different examples of major, and he said, like, two of these, however, are in Hebrew. He said, I don't read Hebrew, but I see my friend, Rabbi Saperstein, sitting out there in the audience. I'm going to ask him to come up here 
I'm thinking in my head, on national television, and translate what the Hebrew of the inscriptions we have. I have no idea how clear it's going to be or what it's going to be. So I, I get up. One was from the Boston Public Library. Fortunately, it was clear. I was able to do it. And then one was the famous freeze that's always argued about in the Supreme Court itself. You know, there's a freeze um, alongside of the Supreme Court wall and shows all the great lawgivers. And one of them is Moses carrying the Ten Commandments. And the classic, the right always says, how is it that the Supreme Court can have this and the kids in our classrooms can't? Why is it important a value to show the Supreme Court and not important to show our kids? And the, the church state the separation advocates always say, well, here it's not a religious thing. It's part of a series of people, Solon and Hammurabi and a whole group of great lawgivers, including, by the way, Mohammed, um, uh, here, all of whom are shown there to show the history of the giving of law and the evolution of law. It's not intended in this context to convey that. And the Supreme Court people are adults. They can think what they want about it. It's different than having it in a center of inculcation of values um, uh, that comprises our school, our classroom setting. So I look at this, and I burst out laughing. I have never, with all the times I've been in the Supreme Court, maybe a hundred times, for different cases, one kind or another, where I've been uh, sitting watching the, the, and every time I always glance up, I never looked at it carefully. And either the person who did the Supreme Court freeze, either knew absolutely no Hebrew at all, and consulted no one who knew any Hebrew, or, as I prefer to think, had a kind of wicked sense of humor. Because if you look at it up close, he is holding the Ten Commandments like this in his arms, and his beard comes down over it in such a way as to cover the first word, low, in the second Ten Commandments, second half of the Ten Commandments. So in Hebrew it reads, kill, steal, commit adultery, bear false witness against your neighbor, cover your neighbor's wife. Um, uh, you know, which you kind of got to love um, in, this, uh, in this context. Look, I mean, the bottom line about the, you know, for the Ten Commandments um, is if we, if we are able through our churches and our synagogues and our mosques and our temples and our families to inscribe the values of the Ten Commandments on the hearts and minds of our children, It'll make a difference in their classrooms, in their world. It will achieve what the religious right calls for by posting it in the classrooms, a more moral classroom. But if all the Ten Commandments is, is a kind of visual music sitting up there, it'll do as much for morality in our classrooms as the Gideon Bibles have done for morality in our motel rooms here. This is just not something of religious significance. I, you know, I often point out to, to people, think about for a minute, how many of you can tell me without looking at it, on a $20 bill, where it says, in God we trust? How many of you can tell me on a $1 bill, without looking at it, where it says, in God we trust? All right, let me ask you the more important question. I'll settle for this. And I'll withdraw my point, if anyone can, do, can answer this. Give me the name of one, just one, of the 300 million Americans, of those you know, of the 300 million Americans, or have ever heard about, who has used the dollar differently because God's name is inscribed in it. And when I think of the use to which we have put God's name Truly, that is a violation of the commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the eternal, your God, in vain. You know, when you use it in a way that has strips it of its meaning, I object to it. Forget about the constitutional arguments. I object to it on religious grounds. In the main, the religious right has foisted a myth on America that somehow separation of church and state is anti-God and anti-religion. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is precisely that wall keeping government out of religion, that has allowed religion in American life to flourish with a diversity and strength unmatched anywhere, anywhere in the developed world, in the democratic world today. 
at least the Western democratic world. India is the only country that rivals us. But if you look at the number of people who go regularly to worship, it dwarfs all the other democratic countries. If you look at the number of people believing in God, 90% of American people, look at the people who say they hold religious values central to their lives, 80% of the American people, it dwarfs those in every other Western democratic country, including every one of those that has government-sponsored, government-preferred, government-established religions. And so this battle for freedom is a battle for our particular as well as universal concerns. Two other issues. First, the environment, something that links together all of our religious communities, right and left. Every different religious stream that I know of in the world. For those of us who come from the Abrahamic face, we know why we must be involved. The earth is the eternals and the fullness thereof. What we own, we own in a trust relationship with God, with God requiring that we protect all of God's creation. And the image, the icon, the image of the whole earth taken from out of space is the icon, the revelation of our lifetime. No other generation before us ever saw that image. And we can see now how precious is creation with the green fields and the rolling hills and the towering mountains and the blue seas. We see it the way God did, Kitov, and it was good. But just at the very moment in human history, when from outer space, we see with clarity, wonder, and awe how precious is God's creation, we're suddenly confronted by startling peril, evidence of its peril and of damage already being wrought by our own hands, by our ignorance, by our indifference, by our greed affecting all of us indiscriminately, global warming, ozone depletion, the escalating eradication of entire species of life, the melting of our polar ice caps, the destruction of our rainforests, runaway world population, the population of the world doubled between the year one and the year 1200. Today it is doubling once every 40 years. And I, like you, feel this personally, for this is my home. Everybody that I had ever loved lived or lives or will live here. Every child or grandchild of yours or mine will inherit this home, however we leave it. The Midrash, the Jewish interpretations of the Bible, recounts that in the hour when God created the first human, God brought the human before all the trees of, garden of uh, the Garden of Eden and said, see my works, how fine and excellent they are. Now all that I have created, for you have I created it, Think about this, and do not corrupt and desolate my world. For if you destroy it, there will be none after you to set it right again. The task of all people of conscience is, in speaking truth to power, to ensure that God's mandate is heard today by all humanity. For this God is our God, this earth is our garden. And this time we face not expulsion, but devastation. And that we cannot, dare not allow to occur neither for our children's sake, nor for God's. And a word about Darfur, something else that has unified our religious communities. And I bring this up because we've been at the core of fighting for the rights of the people in Darfur to end the ethnic cleansing that has taken place there. And yet, and yet, it goes on. When I was a kid, I remember hearing for the first time the extraordinary opera by Giancarlo Manatti called The Council. Story, a part of it is a story about a refugee seeking safety and freedom, going to a country, going to the, uh, uh, the consulate, asking for a visa, and filling out that application over and over again. And when it came to occupation, putting, waiting, waiting, waiting. Well, today, the people of Darfur, five years of the horrors of genocidal activity is still waiting. They wait for a UN force that has the capacity to actually protect them from attacks. They wait for the newly appointed US envoy to help bring about a just and long-lasting peace. They wait for our help to ensure the restoration 
of humanitarian organizations that have worked to keep them alive under the darkest of circumstances. They wait until the world no longer allows President Bashir to promote violence and death over peace and life. People of goodwill here and across the globe have worked towards that day. We've marched, we've rallied, we've lobbied, and yet, and yet the ethnic cleansing continues. We've contributed to humanitarian efforts, helped rebuild camps and medical facilities that have saved lives of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, and yet the children and parents of Darfur die. We have raised our voices and a chorus heard from the halls of, this, of our Congress to the White House, to capitals across the globe, to the United Nations, to the chambers of the International Criminal Court. Laws have been passed, policies changed, actions taken aimed at ending this debacle holding responsible the perpetrator of this genocidal activity, and yet President Bashir remains free to continue his crimes against humanity. We've seen the power that we have together to make changes, and yet even now as the wheels of justice begin to turn, we feel the pain of every Darfurian man, woman, and child who has survived the violence of the John Jaweed only to face the peril of starvation, contaminated water, disease from their leader's malicious and intentionally imposed denial of his own people to the life-saving ministries of heroic aid organizations. The dwindling medical supplies, the scarce water and food, the spread of disease through refugee and IDP camps are all too quickly taking their toll on the people of Darfur, succeeding where bullets have failed. Yet the death of the people of Darfur, whether from bullets or the president's actions, President Bashir's actions, remains just as certain. The people of Darfur are survivors. They survived the rape of their mothers and sisters. This use of rape as a weapon of war has got to end. They've witnessed this, they survived the senseless killing of their fathers. They survived air attacks from Sudanese planes. They survived the pillaging of their villages. They survived walking for days in search of the fragile safety of a refugee camp. They survive life in these camps where thousands compete for resources and danger lurks on the camp's borders. They survive for years waiting for the intervention that never, that, that an intervention that works, which is a fading hope that eludes them still. And the aid workers are heroes and survivors. They survived attacks on their colleagues and restrictions on their communication and the desperation in the eyes of those they seek to help fulfilling the values embodied in the Talmud 2,000 years ago, that to save one life is as though you have saved the entire world. I've been to the camps where the work of each of the hundreds and hundreds of international aid workers in Darfur has saved untold lives. And yet, we are fearful that that work may be in vain. And the people in those camps, they have no PACs, no lobbies to speak for them. So we have to be their voice for justice, their hope for life. And that is a voice of conscience that we represent. The Nobel Prize winning poet Nellie Sachs, a German Jewish refugee who fled Nazi persecution, once wrote of the Holocaust, oh, the night of the weeping children, oh, the night of the children branded for death. Sleep may not enter here. Terrible nursemaids have usurped the place of mothers. Instead of mother's milk, panic suckles the little ones. Yesterday, mother still drew sleep toward them like a white moon. There was a doll with cheeks, the rouge by kisses, and one arm the stuffed pet, already brought to life by love, and in the other, now blows the wind of dying, blows the shifts over the hair that no one will ever comb again. It was seized by the memory of the one and a half million children who perished in the Holocaust by the children of Armenia, Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda. Let us speak out and act as a religious voice of conscience to ensure that it will not be too late for the people of Darfur. Look, my friends, we live in an extraordinary moment in human history. In the lifetimes of many alive today, we have split the atom, cracked the genetic code, 
pierce the veil of outer space itself. And as Father Brian Hare has noted, in a world in which you can do almost everything, what you should do, the moral question, is humanity's central challenge. And that, that is something that we in the religious community have something vital and important to say. Technology has changed the nature of human politics. We're the first generation in all of human history that cannot afford to make the same errors as those who went before. It is almost as though all of human history has been a dry run for this moment, and this time it counts. At the same time, we live in an age that for the first time in human history produces enough food to feed every child of God. A failure to feed them now is a failure of moral vision and political will. We're the first generation that can wipe out diseases that have plagued humanity from time immemorial. If we fail to do so now, it is a failure of moral vision and political will. We have the ability to educate every child, to reverse environmental degradation, to build a foundation of peaceful cooperation amongst the nations of the world. If we fail to do it now, it is a failure of moral vision and political world. This is what our ancestors can only dream about, what they live for and too often died for, to transmit these values generation to generation, Lador Vador, hoping and praying for such a time as this when we can finally make real those dreams. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the holiday of Purim. Do you remember the remarkable verses in the book of Esther where Mordecai beseeches Esther to lobby King Ahasuerus on behalf of her people? At first she demurs, and Mordecai challenges her and says to her, who knows whether your elevation to the royal house, to access and power and influence, was not for such a time as this. For such a time as this. May we not see the unprecedented freedom given all of us in North America at such remarkable crossroads of human history. The ability to affect the policies of the world's most important nations has granted us for just such a time as this. The Midrash then comments that this remarkable woman lobbyist, Queen Esther, decides she will engage on this advocacy on behalf of the values and interests of her people and observes, according to the Midrash, I shall go then, and God shall lend me God's right hand and left hand with which the universe was created. What a stunning image. It is the only time in the Midrash I have ever found this image occurring. Often it talks in anthropomorphic terms about God doing this with the left hand, God doing this with the right hand, but only in going to the king to plead for justice do we find the image that our hands are the hands of God, that the work we do is God's work here on earth. My friends, when you lean down to feed a hungry child, your hands are the hands of God. And when you march for racial equality or freedom or Israel's security or human rights, wherever they may be, your feet are the feet of God. As Heschel said in Selma, I felt like my feet were praying. And when you turn your eyes to injustice, others would rather ignore your eyes are the eyes of God. And when you listen, where others would turn away, your ears are the ears of God. And when you speak out against hatred and intolerance and bigotry, your voice is the voice of God. And when you work day in and day out, as so many of you do, in the volunteer work you do, in your professional work in the serving professions, in the donations that you work for, that you contribute to, as you work day in and day out to feed the hungry and clothe the poor and raise up the downtrodden, then your work is truly the work of God. And that is the work we are called to do here on earth at this moment. And to anyone who has taken the Bible seriously, we know to God's call to us, there is only one answer. Hineni, here I am. Here I am, here we are. All of us sharing this great commitment to justice that are a common theme of our religious traditions and heritage. Let that be what brings us together. The sense that we are not the prisoners of a bitter and unremitting past but the shapers of a better and more hopeful future. For if we can work together to make that real, 
then justice shall well up like waters and righteousness like that mighty stream and we shall indeed create for our children the world they so richly deserve. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you, dear. I think we all need a few minutes to digest what you've just told us, David. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> the $2,000 billion that is being spent this year and next year to bail out the excess of avarice and fraud and greed in the national financial system which was underwritten in silence, not only by your organization, but by both political parties for the last 15 years. That $2,000 billion could go most of the way towards solving, or at least making progress on every one of the social, progressive, environmental, and ecumenical issues that you discussed during your talk, including Darfur, including climate change and global warming, including water rights. And yet I notice not only have I not heard from you speaking up before the whole edifice crashed down, but while millions of our neighbors are facing financial ruin and the loss of their homes, I know it wasn't the topic you were listed for. Mm -hmm. You didn't even allude to it today. Mm -hmm. And yet that money, which has gone down into the public sanitation system of life could have helped to solve every one of the issues that you teed up for us to think about. So from a progressive reform mm -hmm. perspective, how do, how, how do you match up? Tell, forgive me, tell me your name. Lee, Lee. Maldaver. Lee, uh, I really thank you for that question. It, it is a really great question. There's, there's more than one bound up with it. So let me try and pick those apart and uh, deal with them uh, very quickly the best I can. Um, it is true in the main that the religious communities did not talk, did not address the questions of greed and avarice that marked the system. I would put two caveats to that. One is, Throughout all of that, there was a religious community, I gave a number of examples, who were pushing, you can't leave the poor behind. The gap between the rich and the poor is unconscionable. Um, in our movement, uh, although many of our people benefited for it, we had very strong policy against the, Ray, the uh, Bush tax cuts in 2001 that I think greatly exacerbated um, uh, many of the uh, problems that we, uh, that we had. But it was the religious communities over and over again that were talking about the poor can't be left out. Debt relief has to be, re debt has to be restructured on an international level. We need to take care of the poor here. We were the ones who were beating the drum about universal health care and uh, moving the system on uh, universal health care during a time that others were not paying um, uh, attention to it. So the religious community has a strong record about speaking to the poor, but not on some of the other issues. And the only second caveat I would put was, it is a little easy to look back and say it was self-evident what was happening. But, you know, I was really struck, I, I, I don't, I'm a big John Stewart fan, uh, here, and he had Jim Cramer, you know, on his thing, just savaged him over, this was in part the failure of the media um, uh, here to speak truth um, about this issue. And I thought Richard Cohn, the Washington Post columnist, had a, a very, very powerful response to that, where he said, there is no evidence that people knew what was happening and simply didn't talk about it. And the key evidence in the other part of it was all of the people who were the heads of all of these corporations, the heads of the financial institutions, they didn't withdraw their money. They kept their money there. They didn't see it coming. They didn't know it was happening. They lost much of their fortunes went down the tubes a oh well with it. The head of Lehman Brothers had much of his money tied up with it. He lost everything like everyone else did in this. The notion that it was widely known, all of the problems that were going on, and was a failure of, of will, a bravery of people to speak truth to this, 
it's easier to see now in retrospect than it was then. So I'll just offer you know, that one uh, caveat. As to what should be done now, I think the, re the religious community has been very, very forceful about this issue of protecting the poor, of the mortgage, uh, mortgage restructuring to keep people in their homes being part of this issue, of ensuring that some of the structural things will be done um, will incorporate protection of the poor and revamping structures to work fairer and more equitably, learning some of the lessons uh, on, on this issue. Um, I can give you, you know, the personal experience I've had, some of you may know, um, I, uh, I was honored to be asked to join this White House Council of Religious and Civic Leaders that the President put together to advise him on, on some of this policy. We've had, you know, we had one meeting with the, directly with the President in the Oval Office, and every single person in the room was saying the same thing um, at that time, that we have to keep the focus on this issue, wall to wall of the people who are there. It's been said, it just came from a meeting of top uh, Senate leadership this past week, in which, again, an array of religious leaders and others came exactly about the question of what's going to happen to the poor. This can't just be about rescuing the system, which may have to be done. It has to be about protecting the poor as well. Um, this isn't a question of the religious communities being able to do everything they want to do, everything they call for, everything they talk about, and so their voices too often get drowned out. Um, in this, but it is not out of obliviousness to this. Um, the issue of global poverty and the issue of domestic poverty is the number one priority, the number one priority that unifies all the religious community together. If it wasn't in the talk explicitly, although in the beginning I talked about global poverty one being one of the crossroads issues, it's just in a given amount of time I could have picked an entirely different set of crucial issues, not mention one of the ones I did, and it would have you know, covered the gamut of other fascinating, challenging issues that we face um, uh, today on this. There was nothing about, it should not be taken as a reflection of anything that any religious group I know of in America doesn't see. You have Rick Warren saying, the great failure of my career was not grappling with poverty. Evangelicals must stop dealing just with the social issues and deal with poverty. He didn't say stop dealing with the social issues, but he said we have to deal with poverty. It is the central moral problem that we face. You have the Pope who has said this over and over again, the American Catholic bishop over and over again, all of the Jewish institutions and mainline Protestant groups doing this over and over again. It is the great unifying theme um, about this. So I hope that we're going to win some of these battles. And the next time I'm back in Santa Barbara, Lee, you're going to stand up and say, I'm glad you listened to me when I made this appeal that you guys have to do that because it's something we share deeply in common with each other. Yeah. How in a progressive religious community can we reach out to fundamentalist religious sects that have and demean women? Well, the, again, th that battle will be won within the Muslim world, and we have to figure out how to support those religious scholars, those religious organizational leaders, the, the women who are fighting these battles in a way that strengthens them rather than undercuts them. Uh, here, I mean, and, you know, this, this is, it's the same in the Jewish world. Um, uh, here, you know, of Jewish Orthodox women feminists who are trying to change the way um, the patterns of attitudes towards women have played out um, in the community. How to reform and conservative Jews, strengthen them without their being seen as, oh, you're more like them than you are like us um, about it. This is a real paradox and challenge um, that we, uh, you know, that we have to deal with. We know the ingredients of parts of it, all right? Parts of it is there are indirect ways we can get tremendous resources to these groups that are, will really be helpful to them without it having to come directly from us. We have many allies in the Muslim world. We have to ask Muslim governments who are funding such things that can be helpful on such things to step up to the plate and be the funders and the, the visible supporters of some of these groups rather than Western um, uh, countries, uh, Western countries doing that. Um, right now, the fundamentalists very much um, dominate the internet airwaves. There are ways of getting resources, training 
to more moderate uh, forces to allow them to stand on their own feet and to compete with those, uh, with those uh, kinds of groups. Um, third, a lot of these things happen in a context, in economic context. If there is economic hope and betterment, it greatly strengthens the more moderate forces. If there is economic despair, it is a despair that is played on by the fundamentalists who offer easy answers to difficult, um, uh, to difficult problems. Why is it that Hamas and Hezbollah have done so well in the areas of the world because they have failed government structures around them. They start providing social services um, uh, to people, and those social services um, become the organizing principles. They bring people into their communities. They provide educational services. It's those educational services, the madrasas that are funded by the Saudis and others in areas around the world, the ones that get from Iran to Hezbollah, the ones that Hamas have uh, developed that helps create the next generation of people. I often, uh, you know, in, when I'm dealing with international um, issues, in for, ask the question, if we had mobilized all of our friends in the Muslim world to put $10 billion on September 12th into Pakistan to build an alternative government-run educational system to compete with the mad madrasas in every community in Pakistan. Might that have been a better use of $10 billion um, uh, here than some of the uses we put it to um, in terms of this? We have to begin to think strategically in these kinds of ways. And we know through civic, uh, uh, building, um, uh, of building civic structures, labor unions, free press, um, have access to higher learning for, uh, for women, um, that we really can make a difference. And those, those are things that we can um, invest in and support and help make a difference in. So there has to be an overall strategic plan uh, to deal with these things, and this is one of the key issues here. It is really disheartening some of the steps taken in the, under Afghan law and in practice, the attacks on, forget about higher education, the physical attacks on schoolgirls, you know, who are junior high students, grade school students, the physical attacks, acid attacks, beaten, uh, girls beaten up on this kind of thing, simply because as the Taliban moves back in these areas, simply because they are going to school. We have to provide the kind of training for the armed forces and the police in Afghanistan to protect institutions of civil society in a way that can function. Otherwise, none of this is going to work. So it has to be, there's no one answer to it. It has to be this broad array of responses to that program if we're really going to make a dent and make a difference. Thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you. I've recently just heard a Foxman talk about the internet, and the internet is like a media gone wild because there's so much hate and propaganda on it. So can you address that? It is. Look, this is Eva. I mean, this is something Abe also saw. But you can go back a decade. The stuff that you see in the Muslim community, particularly on the internet, the anti-Semitism in general, in general. Jews did better throughout history under Muslim rule than they did on Christian rule. They were given more rights, more protection, more ability to live out their lives with some element of freedom and opportunity in the Muslim world. Even though they were second class citizens, do you mean second class citizens, Jews and Christians, because they believed in the one God, many more opportunities than than uh, the infidels were uh, uh, accorded under Muslim law. And Jews fared much better. they rarely pogroms, rarely the kind of uh, a systemic anti-Semitism that uh, occurred so much in the, uh, in the uh, Christian world. And there are historical reasons, ideological reasons why that was uh, true. What you've seen in the last 20 years, it is so frightening, is that expressions of anti-Semitism that never existed in Islam, never, Things taken from Christian anti-Semitism, ritual murder kind of uh, thing, et cetera, and from uh, neo, uh, uh, pseudo-scientific racialism that led to Nazism, images of the Jews as an inferior race, uh, cancer on, on, on the world that has to be removed, um, the protocols of the elders of Zion, all kinds of things associated with uh, Nazism are now being brought into the Muslim world and, info, and infiltrating communities across the globe via the internet in a way that is just horrific. 
It really is really, really frightening. And this is a new phenomenon. And it's happened very quickly. And again, there is not an easy way to deal with it. But we have to be far more strategic. The ADL's traditional way of dealing with things, educate people, help them understand the truth, have interaction with people, it's not going to be the way, and they, they know that, they're leading the way in recognizing this is a brave new world and we have to, uh, to deal with it. None of us have easy, easy answers to these problems. It's one of the reasons that I say we have to provide the training and resources on the internet for moderate forces to let them do their own thing. It can't be we set up a radio station and we let them broadcast on our set up radio station. I mean, they're delegitimized before they open their mouths um, when these kinds of things, a Voice of America kind of thing, it has a role, but it will never be the central way we're going to win the hearts and minds of the uh, Muslim world. So we really have to think about this differently, not easy answers. What I'm really intrigued to find out, I'm switching gears here a little bit, but it's been part, it was part of the internet thing that they were talking about. It was not only about this, it was reaction to Madoff and, and the, uh, the meltdown of Wall Street that, um, uh, that Abe was talking about in the last study that they released about the rise of anti-Semitism on the internet. But what I'm really curious about is when the ADL comes out with its next poll about anti-Semitic attitudes, if any of that translates into, uh, into increasing anti-Semitic attitudes in the United States. I suspect it will not, but we're going to see. I mean, what the ADL was suggesting is it very well might um, uh, here, for reasons I don't have an opportunity to go into, but I will point out that if you look in the last 30 years, if you look at the scandals of the 1980s, Milliken, Jeffrey Levitt, all of those people, and you look at the, all of the stuff about the Jewish neocons and Iraq being the product of the Jewish neocons, um, here, there was a horrid statement by a guy by the name of Michael Shoy. You can go online and read it if you want. Former CIA guy um, uh, here just, I think, this last week talking about Jews who support Israel as a fifth column, no different in America, no different than the copperheads who betrayed America for the South at that time, and we're never going to solve the problems of the world until we deal with those Jews and others who, who have more loyalty to Israel. I mean, you know, the, this kind of thing that you hear, I don't think, in, in no point up until now, has it ever translated in the last 30 years into rising levels of anti-Semitism, which said to me for a long period of time, not in any group, by the way, it says to me that we really have reached kind of a, a sea change in America, where the sins and crimes of individuals are no longer cast on to the group. But whether or not the current meltdown is so significant and so frightening to the American people, it does lead to that kind of scapegoating. I am very anxious to see, and I'll await eagerly the ADL's report on it. Um, it will, you know, one way or another, we're going to learn a lot, a lot from this, because it doesn't get worse than this. And so many Jewish names are, are seen as synonymous with this. It's going to be really fascinating to see what, uh, you know, what comes out. There is so much to do to heal the world. How do you focus on which things to do when? Oh, you send out a, an electronic newsletter every week, right. and it has about three things in it. And I'm I, always I amazed. That. They are always important, and they always have ins, inside insights yeah. from the fact that you're I, in Washington. What is the most effective way for us to lobby and to focus on what, gotcha. what needs to be gotcha. done. Okay, let me, uh, let me answer that in a couple of different ways. First, we have people from different religious traditions here, but whatever denomination you are associated with, um, your Washington office of that denomination has networks of activists around the country who share the general view sh the, that's a formal position of those denominations. And I really urge you to go online to those offices and become, become part of the legislative networks and the advocacy networks and the social justice networks of the denomination that you're a part of. For those of you who are from the Jewish community, um, I, don't, I didn't bring uh, material with me, but if you go online, the, the institution I run is the Religious Action Center, R-A-C. If you go online at www dot rac.org 
pretty easy to remember. Or just go to my name, and uh, you'll see the, the name of the institution that you can click on. Um, and sign up to be part of the networks that you were just alluding to. Um, here we have thousands and thousands of people all across America who are part of these networks that really make us as effective as we are. And you become part of a community of people that really wants to make a difference. Um, when I'm speaking to churches and synagogues, you know, I talk about breaking down social justice into educational programs, that is programs educating your, your synagogue or your house of worship or the broader community about issues. Um, social service program, feeding people, helping clean up the environment, um, and advocacy programs um, uh, here, which you're advocating for issues either as individuals that is facilitated by the House of Worship or on behalf of uh, the denomination or House of Worship of which you're a part, depending on the practice of your um, uh, House of Worship or community. Um, and finally, the use of money donations and using money in a socially responsible way, um, uh, et cetera, that these are the four components. And every one of our houses of worship ought to be doing at least one of those a year. In terms of which that house of worship does, or which you as an individual does, I'm going to just say the obvious. Every one of you knows this. You don't need me to say it. Um, it doesn't matter. Pick what the passion of your heart is. Leave yourself open to being moved to engage with new things. But never let the recognition that you cannot do everything everywhere stop you from doing anything anywhere. We all can make a difference. So if you can't write on everything, just pick the stuff that really speaks to you to write on. We don't put three a week out because we think three times a week every member of the tens of thousands who are part of our networks are going to write on every one of them. We know they have different interests. We want to touch on those interests, and we want to let those people know when something that they are interested in is coming up for a vote. And if we, we have networks in which if people let us know their issues, we send directly to them. But to the broader universe of people, we just every week will focus on three issues, and we know people will write on the ones that they write on. And we can see their responses when people open it up and go directly to send emails to their legislators, the congresspersons, and, and we know, uh, you know which are the ones, therefore, get the best reaction and what people want to be served on more, and we'll provide more information on those issues once we see higher levels of responses on an issue. Um, in terms of effectively communicating on advocacy um, issues, the one thing I will tell you is the thing that works better than anything else is a personal communication. A personal communication. I, if you want to sign a petition, do it, but it doesn't get counted in congressional offices. If you do it for PR purposes, we got 10,000 signatures, that's great. Local community, it may make a difference. In Washington, it really doesn't. Don't sign form postcards. Don't send a letter that you know everyone's sending the exact same letter in the exact same wording. Once they recognize that's going on, they're not going to do it. Even email is counted differently by congressional offices. They haven't figured out yet exactly how much to weight it. And a one-paragraph personal letter counts as much as a 10-page magnum opus. Both counted once. If you feel compelled to write a 10-page magnum opus, Write in installments, so it gets counted uh, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of times. If you really want to have an effect, ask a couple of tough questions in the beginning of the letter. Because if they are questions a secretary can't spit out a, re a form letter to respond to, they have to send it on to the legislative aide who's working on that issue. Or better yet, pick up the phone and call your congressional office, the local one, and ask them, or go online and take a look at your congressional, and find out who the staff person is, the legislative aide, who's working that issue. Because they're the people who research the issue, make recommendations to the member of Congress, draft legislation, draft speeches. They're the ones that you want to meet. Better yet, invite them to come and speak at your church and synagogue. Because A, they do have the influence, B, they have the time. You can develop personal relationships with them that are much harder to replicate with actual members. And this is true with state senators and assemblymen uh, uh, and assemblywomen as well. Uh, here, the same thing would apply. Nurture them. Very often, 
a high percentage of current senators and congresspersons began as legislative assistants in congressional offices. And these are often relationships that over the decades will turn into real political access and real political clout. They'll be deeply appreciative. You know who they are, that you think they're important, and they're often great speakers, and they want to make these connections. So, you know, that's another way of dealing with this as well. By the way, you should know, in the White House, in the issues that are the big issues, like the budget issues, not little things, but the budget issues, they divide them for and against, and they just put them on a scale and weigh them. So right on heavy paper. Um, the, um, uh, the, the bottom line is, there, you know, why do letters matter? It's what I call the gun control scenario. Public opinion polls show 70% of more Americans, of, of Americans, want tougher gun control legislation. 30% are opposed to it, right? But it never passes, why? It never passes because, because the 70% who want tougher gun control, they don't vote on that issue. They don't give money on that issue. The 30% who are members of the National Rifle Association, they really care about this issue. So if you ask of that set of people who will remember what you do when you walk into the voting booth, who will give money on an issue, who will support an opponent over that issue, 85% of them are against gun control. So if people come from middle America, what good do they get from standing up to the National Rifle Association that they know will target them the next time on doing this? So it's what I call the gun control scenario. It doesn't matter what the public opinion polls show. How do senators and congresspersons know when something is important enough to, that it may affect the way you'll vote? Well, one of the best reads they have is if you care enough to write a personal letter. If you care enough to write a personal letter, you're likely to remember what they're doing on it. That's why personal letters or phone calls to the office are so vitally important. They do keep track of the numbers, and they do take some of the more interesting ones and pass them on to the legislative assistants and some on to the members uh, themselves. Telling a human interest story often will get it to the attention of the member of Congress who sometimes will read it on the floor of the, uh, uh, of the Congress. I will tell you my proudest day in my work, I've been doing this for 35 years. Um, you all remember Pete Wilson? former governor and former mayor of San Diego, um, but in between those two things, served as United States Senator, and we wanted a, uh, a vote, we wanted, he chaired a subcommittee we wanted a vote on. We wrote to all of our rabbis and social justice activists. They flooded the, the, his uh, phone with so many phone calls that one of his top staff people called and said, enough, enough, you're tying up on lines, we can't get any work done. Tell your people we got the message. We're not going to stand in the way of this vote. I've never been prouder of our community at that uh, period of time. Um, uh, here And yes, it does feel overwhelming sometimes. I understand that. Um, and, you know, again, it shouldn't stop us from doing whatever we feel we are able to do, politically, volunteer-wise, professionally to make a difference, and I think in my personal life in terms of responsibilities to educate people, provide direct services, be involved as an advocate. I think about it as I give my money, I think about it as I volunteer my activity, as well as what I do in my uh, professional life. My, my mentor, Al Vorspan, who many of you uh, know, the most eloquent spokesperson on social justice in American Jewish life, um, was fond of saying that the difference between an optimist and a pessimist is that an optimist argues that this is the best of all possible worlds, and a pessimist agrees. <laughs> we look around the world, and the problems we face are extraordinarily daunting. But 3,000 years ago, we took forth that vision from Sinai that changed human history. And through its impact on the Christian world and the Muslim world and the secular world, it has in the main made this world a better place. What I would suggest is that that vision that came from Sinai, mediated by Jesus and Mohammed, that that vision is needed more today than ever before.